Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Making It Personal is provided by Sarah Vocations Ministry. Learn more at joinserra.org. Making It Personal with Bishop William Johnson on Iowa Catholic Radio and iowacatholicradio.com. Welcome to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. I'm Jean Till, and on today's show is Sister Julia Wall. She's a Franciscan sister of perpetual adoration and the author of For Love of the Broken Body. Mm, and it's that central theme that she experienced on lots of levels. Mm-hmm. So it's a very rich, uh, and I'm a woman who's on fire with love for the Lord and mm-hmm. for his Eucharistic presence. So we look forward to, to talking with someone mm-hmm. who's, uh, she's, uh, our paths have crossed in life at various venues. So this is a nice chance to reconnect. Here we are, the 21st of September. Already. Distant memory, the Iowa, Iowa State game, you know, it's like, okay, for all the fervor. <laughs> And then the bitterness of a defeat or the exaltation by Monday, everyone just kind of goes on with life. And That's right. There's another game coming. So, right. you know, but uh, the transience uh, of all that and yet uh, how it rouses us. Uh, you know, we know in the fall season approaching, Christ Our Life is still, we can't say it enough, right? <laughs> ChristOurLifeIowa.com. Get your tickets. <laughs> Get your tickets and join us. I think we're going to. It'll be a, a moment of, of, of the gospel, a moment of uh, evangelization, a moment of uh, affirming and building up our sisters and brothers in the faith, and maybe uh, God speaking the hearts of vocations, of religious life, or priesthood, mm-hmm. as for Sister Julia, uh, but the ways in which the Sarans pray for this mm-hmm. and uh, how all comes together. The call that God gave St. Matthew today is the feast of St. Matthew. Yes. Marvelous uh, you know, story there. He doesn't shine a light on himself, but uh, the ways in which that encounter with Jesus transformed him, the way in which a single glance from our Lord uh, somehow coaxed to Matthew beyond himself to find his true calling, his true identity in Christ. You know, that that addiction that we can have to ambition or even misery that uh, mm-hmm. we come ourselves. And so Jesus, who lives at the border as a Erasmo uh, Maricacus uh, reminds us, Leva Maricacus, in his you know, ma- you know, magnificent tome on the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is a man who lives at the border between time and eternity, between sin and holiness, between man's sphere and God. And that treasure that he gives us to be in his company. Friends lie down together in celebratory love at the table, a position of vulnerability, familiarity, and shared human comfort. That celebration then, and the, the discipleship is not to work for Jesus as some employee, but to be with Jesus, the way in which the master should set us at ease by his way, his readiness to be familiar with those around him, to hold no secrets amidst all the toil of the world. And so that following him is another way of saying, become my companion, to break bread with me, and to break bread, to celebrate. You know, there is a, a place for fasting and asceticism, obviously, But I think that great celebratory spirit, that though we know ourselves to be sinners at the Eucharist and in other uh, moments of of encounter, and we're going to hear from Sister Julie in this Mm -hmm. regard, how she discovered that her great intimacy as her heart longed for for communion in many ways, but uh, reminded by uh, Father Simeon, Erasmo Leva Maricacus, of Sir Toby Belch's question to Malvolia on Twelfth Night of Shakespeare, Dost thou think, because thou art virtuous, there shall be no more cakes and ale. And so the, the capacity to feast well and to do so in a way that doesn't leave us spent or dissipated, uh, that uh, we repeat this kind of rinse cycle of sin and self-degradation, uh, de- but that we're called out of ourselves in a way then that uh, drawing others to the table by our very being, our goodness, our love for, for who we are, and so maybe we call it a kind of sober inebriation that God bestows in Christ as a sign of that indwelling that uh, get, breaks through our frozen heart. Jesus then, that physician who can intervene, heal, and walk with us, his love, his presence. The physician is himself the only food that can heal alienation from God. And so that great love in our own brokenness, the way in which Matthew uh, in that famous call, the Car- Caravaggio painting, but uh, how for each of us uh, in these days when a harvest is about to come forth in September, uh, we worship him, uh, as I was wisely told, amidst all the pigskin uh, f- f- frenzy and feasting and tailgating, 
to worship uh, at most one of the churches, the Church of Saturday of college football or the Church of Sunday pro football, but not <laughs> both. So uh, be, uh, be disciplined, be focused, be prudent, but be uh, alive with joy. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and when we return, we'll be visiting with Sister Julia Walsh, a Franciscan sister of perpetual adoration and author of For Love of the Broken Body. You're listening to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson on the Iowa Catholic Radio Network and the Spirit Catholic Radio Network. Welcome back to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson, and on today's show, we are visiting with Sister Julia Walsh, a Franciscan sister of perpetual adoration and author of For the Love of the Broken Body. Wonderful to have you, Sister Julia. Thank you for making the time amidst your many travels and vocation ministry for your community and all that's there. Uh, again, this is not our first encounter as we've uh, walked the, uh, the uh, hills of uh, Dubuque and Loris College. As you were finished your undergraduate degree there when I was just a, a junior faculty member trying to figure <laughs> out what he was doing and you know, getting my... <laughs> Uh, Thank you so much for having me back. It'll be fun to have a conversation with you, Bishop. Yeah, and uh, you know, I focused on St. Matthew on this day that we're airing, but uh, the Feast of St. Francis fast approaching here. And that figure of St. Francis uh, woven throughout your life, your sensibilities as a young woman growing up in in, uh, Clayton County, Fayette County, that northeast Iowa, the beauty that's there, and a kind of contemplative spirit uh, being raised on a farm. Is this something you think, yeah. as you look back, God weaving this into your soul with uh, with his great uh, plans for you in mind? Mm, yeah. I I believe as a child playing in the woods, I became enamored with God's goodness because I recognized the kinship with all creation. I, I recognized every element of creation as... Uh, expression of God's beauty and truth and, and, and goodness. And so I think that really did contribute to my a love for God that developed at a really early age for me. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. You know, your, your uh, memoir, your spiritual memoir for love of the broken body uh, begins in a very compelling way, but you, you preface it by saying that this is a work of creative nonfiction so yes. what, what, how do we take this? You yes. know? <laughs> is truth <laughs> embellished or, uh, you know, standing together that uh, maybe protecting the, the confidentiality of some of the, the people that uh, have shaped your life? Yeah, that's a good question. So the, it is a true story. <laughs> and, <laughs> and there are um, basic, ma- the major events that happened happened as I... You know, I recorded my memories as I as I remember things. I also wove together uh, details from primary sources. I was actually a history college, history major at Loris College, mm-hmm. and so I learned how to study the primary sources of a historical event. And I approached the the story from from that angle initially, and and the storytelling, the narrative emerged from that. In the writing, though, I, you know, there's, there's a few places in the book where maybe I'm describing myself as it sitting in a chapel and pondering and reflecting something. And in those spaces, I can't say that I was actually in a chapel reflecting on those things. I know those were things I was reflecting on in those time periods. And instead of just having a chapter of sharing my musings, I wanted to put something in a scene because the theme captures the attention of a reader in a different sort of way. So that's where the creativity came in, was where I created some scenes that were likely, but I can't say for sure, are completely accurate. No. Uh, and uh, yes, it also I there was editing of, of some of the, you know, things like dialogue. I can't say for sure exactly what the words were seven years later, but as you know, there's what? message conversations, <laughs> and those were edited, too. So, you know, I think, you know, revealing a deeper truth, and we shouldn't, you know, and I appreciate the rigor of history major, the late uh, Dr. David Salvatera would appreciate that, as well as uh, uh, yeah. Professor John Eby and others uh, involved in that, and Kristen Anderson-Bricker and others at Loris on the faculty there. But, uh, 
you know, as with the sacred writers, you know, that the scriptures and the context and everything where Jesus is situated, the things that he's saying, we know, you know, between the synoptics and others, you know, there's even a little bit of variation, which should not be a stumbling block for us because it's a, it's, it, there is a truth there, a spiritual truth, which is being disclosed. That's and, right. and you're very, very transparent in your self disclosure. I mean, you, you hold nothing back, a kind of holy boldness on that front as well. But, uh, you know, you didn't. You grew up in a very faith-filled home, but you know, in a public school environment. And uh, I was kind of bemused to find out that you were a cheerleader for many years. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Cheerleader yeah, nun. It's the same thing, right? <laughs> I, I honestly was afraid it was foolishness. <laughs> but, but you know, I suppose I. I felt compelled in the storytelling, um, and as the creative process unfolded, as, as I started to put the book together and felt very led by the spirit, I realized the story would fall flat if I wasn't authentic in the storytelling. And it's apparent to me that uh, th- there's a need for authentic witnesses in the church. That's what builds up community. Amen. And storytelling builds community, too. So I wanted to uh, paint a real picture of what religious life is like nowadays and what sort of things a young woman, a modern woman who's grappling with a call to religious life is, is, is actually really struggling with when they're, you know, like I am, a product of the culture that I live in. No, no. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. And, uh, you know, being formed to be a, a teacher, to be one who could bring a voice into the, the, the social environment, the issues that uh, impact our culture as well. Uh, but that kind of work ethic that you inherited, uh, mingled with that contemplative spirit. I mean, Francis was there even before you were really conscious of it. You know, the Wartburg campus, the great uh, Lutheran school in Waverly, uh, a, a, a statue of St. Francis on the Wartburg campus. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And my, isn't it amusing that my Lutheran friends said, oh, you're so Franciscan, and, and understood my attraction to that statue and how I would joyfully be up around it. <laughs> they encouraged it without me yet understanding what Franciscanism truly was or religious life really is. Yeah, they were really precious. Because you really hadn't had any interactions with women religious, uh, even through your college years, right? There were maybe one or two, you know, Sister Marlene comes That's to right. mind and uh, Pinska and, and others, but... Uh, uh, that presence. So the the years after college, I always felt like those five years after someone graduated from college, it, there's so much that happens that shakes down there for you. And so, uh, yeah. would you would you concur? I agree. <laughs> it's incredibly <laughs> formative for for people. You know, young people. Those years are so so central in their development and how they become an adult and um, are defined. Their identity is defined. So, but yeah, for myself, after uh, graduating from Morris College in 2003, I then interned in for the Iowa Catholic Conference in Des Moines and helped with lob- the lobbyists for advocating for the bill um, there at the State House. And then I went from there to Sacramento, and I was in the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, and I did a year of service working with uh, formerly homeless uh, parenting and pregnant youth. And then from there. Um, Actually came back and lived in Iowa City for a short stint. This wasn't in the book. <laughs> Lost over. I was going to say, did I miss something here? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, there's definitely, see, this is details how to be left out of the story. But, um, yeah, and I, I did substitute teaching in, in Iowa City. And then, and then I entered the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration in the early 2006 when I was just 24 years old. So, it was a big risk for me to enter that young, but I'm really grateful that the sister said yes to me, <laughs> and here I still am. And and unlike some young women, which understandably, who kind of look at different con- communities, explore maybe websites, spend uh, different weekends and everything else, for you, if I'm reading correctly, it was you know, the Franciscan Sisters, Perpetual Adoration of La Crosse, as the only one that really kind of tugged on your heart. Is that fair to say? Hmm. I think I didn't include that detail in the book, but I actually looked at other communities throughout college, uh, visited maybe three or four other convents, 
Uh, I then also, when I was living in Sacramento that year, I was befriending the Loretto sisters, the IBVM, the Institute of Blessed Virgin Mary sisters, and feeling a resonance with them. And, but I had already uh, encountered the Franciscan sisters in La Crosse, and my relationship with them was forming too. And so they're actually, in my prayer life, um, developed a clarity that I was more attracted to the Franciscans, and that, that was where I was called to go. But it, it took some time and sorting and sifting, like any other, any good discernment. I think, I think a good discernment includes a lot of exploration, and as one is exploring, they're discovering and noticing, oh, this is, this is where I feel more attracted. This is what helps me to feel the most joy. Mm-hmm. There's always more to the story, uh, the texture there, and yeah. uh, the FSPAs, <laughs> the, the most true. famous <laughs> member, uh, Sister Thea Bowman, who, oh, you know, yeah. her cause continues to advance, and hopefully one day she'll be recognized as one of our yeah. American yeah. saints. Thanks but, to the gods for the witness yeah. of Sister Thea yeah. Bowman. Yeah. 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 But it, to be bemused, you know, because, you know, we can kind of be a little bit... Uh, uh, whimsical, a little bit uh, sardonic, you know, Sound of Music and Sister Act actually had some place in, in all of this for you as well. Yes, they did. They really were uh, formative in helping me under, to be introduced to what religious life was or how there was a difference in how sisters were in the world and ultimately helped me sort through, like, okay, I don't think I'm to be a cloistered, a monastic sister. I think I'm meant to be a sister that's uh, with, m- serving on the margins of society. And I was really attracted to that image and sister act. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Wonderful. So uh, the, the tug on the heart, uh, the willingness to go there, uh, you know, your service and encounters with the, those who are poor, those who, as Pope Francis would call, on the periphery as well, but then ultimately, uh, you know, you're, you're very transparent about your heart too. Your heart was for Jesus, but your heart has <laughs> manifested yeah. in some of the men in your life, That's you know, right. and you kind of lay that out, that, that need for human closeness, intimacy, mm-hmm. to be kissed uh, by, by another. Uh, men like Mike and Greg and Brandon uh, were part of the path. It, that wasn't just a, you know, uh, all or nothing decision, right? But to how... Your love for Jesus made you maybe more attracted to some of the men who God placed in your life. Yeah, I think that's true. <laughs> yeah. I I um, have grown convinced that a good discernment is not linear. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's actually more like a web. And there's, you know, all these things that a person has to take in about the things that are tugging on their heart and and recognizing where there's overlap and and what is the most true and life giving, I um, I definitely came to know Christ's presence in a lot of people as I continue to, and had to make choices about what I was going to commit to, what was going to help me become the most alive, the most true to who God made me to be. Not easy choices when a one is full of desire. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. a human. I mean, it isn't Augustine's confessions, but you know, this is a, a confession of sort in a way that you know your heart was 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 large, and so you know the the, the capacity you have for love, which has only grown, and uh, the intimate uh, conversations with Jesus. But uh, I think as we're approaching the, our first break here, our next break, uh, you know. The whole compelling, you know, that you you entered the novitiate, you were accepted, you recall the liturgy that the, that happened and the words that you spoke there. But then a month later, your world is turned upside down, and that becomes the kind of thematic uh, of the broken body. What happened there, and it's a very compelling and and stark uh, account uh, the fall that you had. Right. Right. Yeah, so a month after I entered the militia, it's true, my, I went back to the farm to say goodbye to the land that I grew up on and ended up falling off a cliff and breaking my face um, and my my hand. And so I 
my face was pretty much shattered from my eyebrows to my chin, which created for a very unusual novitiate experience because as a young person and maybe just as a person in general, I knew so much of my face through my, or excuse me, so much of my identity through my physical appearance and how I was appearing to the world. But now my face was disfigured. I was broken. And it gave me a lot to pray with and reflect on as I was also sorting through the questions of um, of vocation and identity and uh, what it meant to be to deepening, be deepening my relationship with Christ and with a community that, whose charism is Eucharistic in Franciscan, which is very much rooted in being a person who is blessed, broken, and shared. Uh, I believe now that that's, that is the arc of everyone's life, as, as we in our daily lives and, and how we give ourselves to God and live our lives of discipleship are living a life of of recognizing how blessed we are to be chosen by God. And and then we all are broken in different ways and there's nothing wrong with us. And it's through our brokenness that we then can share who we are with others. What a profound thought. Share let's let's self, pause there and uh, we can kind of ponder that yeah. as we take a repause. Stay with mm-hmm. us as we continue our conversation with Sister Julia Walsh, a Franciscan sister of perpetual adoration and author of For Love of the Broken Body, Available at Amazon.com. You're listening to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson on the Iowa Catholic Radio Network and the Spirit Catholic Radio Network. Welcome back to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. I think with your perspective and the grace, you know, as you conclude your memoir, you know, if I might read, The broken body I've grown to love is bigger than my own. My bones crushed and shattered, the teeth extracted, replaced with permanent implants, the hand forever bearing the scar next to my knuckle. I now love all those broken parts of me, or at least I've grown to accept them, embrace them, allow myself to carry around these wounds as reminders of what I've survived, been through, of the miracle of God's love that's reformed, reshaped, and reclaimed me. And the way then in which the broken body of Christ I love, you, you continue, is the people of God on the margins of society who know they are broken and feel the pain of being broken as they struggle through every ordinary act. And how then your vocation is forsaken, the intimacy of... of of relations, physical relations, but that way in which uh, is is an embrace of something more, the pain and pleasure and mystery of knowing uh, this love of Christ and surrendering to God's grace. Uh, talk about the miraculous while you were in the ICU, and you do comment how even as, uh, you know, uh, how blessed we are in the United States, in Iowa, to have a standard of health care, that if this accident had happened to you in another continent, that you probably would not be with us in that way. But... Uh, Besides the great medical team, there was a particular nurse figure who uh, seemingly has a, an identity beyond the, the regular staff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is one of the most sacred stories of my life is the encounter with the nurse Jesus. And I will admit that I didn't, um, I, I, there was a part of me that didn't want to share this story with the, the world because it feels so personal and intimate. And yet, uh, that's part of my vow of poverty is that I share share what God has given me if it can if it can be of use to others. So it's true that I was greatly impacted by the love that I came to know through this mysterious nurse named Jesus who chose to sit with me and just love me and taught me how love is about being with, being present. And as I reflected on it throughout my life, I came to recognize that this loving, powerful, silent presence is very similar to the Eucharist that I know and adore in our Adoration Chapel in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, and I know the power of Christ's loving presence is so strong, and um, and I it's the same love that I felt from from that nurse. Well, I assumed he was a nurse. He was just a really nice man who sat with me, <laughs> <laughs> who told me his name was Jesus. Mm. Okay, but uh, <laughs> yeah, embodying that, and I think you know. 
just as you're speaking, you know, your obvious uh, Franciscan charism for the, the the heart for the poor, but your heart for the Eucharist and how, you know, this kind of false antagonism that, you know, I've kind of maybe preached, I <laughs> get a little preachy about, but we don't pit social justice against our sacramental love for, for God and the way he's manifested himself. These are to be seamless in, in our lives. And I think you embody that, Sister Julia, in, in such a beautiful way and uh, that Thank charism you, that sure. you have. In fact, I'm going to put you on the spot here, uh, calling up public. Would you be okay if we excerpted some of your passages uh, to use at our Eucharistic Holy Hour that we have each week at St. Ambrose Cathedral? I think the, we typically have a meditation. Sometimes it's a little more theological and doctrinal, but the, the personal imprint that you put on that, uh, more than any tattoo that uh, anyone could have as you you know your 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 loaf of bread tattoo that uh, adorns your body but uh, the mark you're making on the body of christ of god's compassion and undying love yes i'd be very honored okay well blessings our audience heard it so you're right. I, I have a witness gene okay so so may uh, you continue to to allow the rumblings of other women's hearts to to open them to the the possible mystery to consider religious life, the, the poverty, the obedience, the chastity that ultimately is liberating in the life as it's so exemplified in your, your radiant life. Thank you, Sister Julia. Thank you, Bishop. It was really a pleasure to have this conversation. I, and then your affirmation means the world. Thank you. Plug Bishop, the book one more time, Jean. <laughs> uh, for the, oh, <laughs> you threw me for a minute there. Uh, for Love of the Broken Body, available at Amazon.com. This has been another edition of Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. You can find us online at Iowa Catholic Radio Network or the Spirit Catholic Radio Network. You can hear Making It Personal with Bishop William Johnson every week on Iowa Catholic Radio and iowacatholicradio.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Making It Personal is provided by Sarah Vocations Ministry. Learn more at joinserra.org.